from now. Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Open up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. I take a seven and a half. And here on the soggy shores of Musselvania, we find our heroes, Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Bullwinkle <laughs> Moose. Boy, what a terrible place. Only too true, Musselvania is the wettest, soggiest, dreariest place on Earth. You forgot useless. Useless, too. Situated directly between the United States and Canada, Musselvania has the distinction of being constantly fought over by both countries. The U.S. insists it's part of Canada, and Canada insists it's part of the U.S. Well, why do we come here on our vacation? Because after two weeks in Musselvania, any place else in the world seems like heaven. Send me to Siberia, send me to Wilkes-Barre, but not Musselvania. No, no, don't lose your head. I'm not losing my head. You will if you don't go to Musselvania. What time leaves the next submarine? But just then there was a splintering crash as something flew in through the window. Something with antlers. On top of something with an aviator's helmet. It's a moose and a squirrel, Admiral. They must have been blown here by the depth charge. Then their enemy agents seized them. And our heroes were quickly subdued. I was pretty subdued when we started. All right, you. What was the name of your Submarine? Submarine? Hokey Smoke! Got that, Carruthers? We sank the Hokey Smoke. For many years, all the men who go down to the sea in ships, sailors, fishermen, garbage scow captains, have heard and repeated the story of the legendary whaling whale, Maybe Dick. Maybe Dick was supposed to be big enough to swallow a whole ship. Maybe. He could swim faster than any vessel in the sea. Maybe. And he had been seen by sailors whose reputations for sobriety were beyond reproach. Maybe. Yes, for centuries, Maybe Dick has been a, a shadowy terror for, for all seafaring men. Been. Pretty exciting, eh, Rock? Oh, that's just an old wives' tale, Bullwinkle. Old wives with whiskers? I mean, it's just make-believe. Make-believe? Sure. There's no such thing as a wailing whale. Well, if you can't believe what you read in the comic books, what can you believe? Oh, Bullwinkle. It's enough to destroy a young moose's face. Oh, come on. There just couldn't be such a thing. You did sure make a good premise for a story, though. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. <laughs> begins over three decades ago. They were much simpler times then. The world didn't seem as complicated as it is today, nor did the people. The children of the baby boom generation were growing up in an environment that, on the surface, seemed ordered and secure. It was in many ways a carefree time when Americans looked to the future with hope and optimism. Our president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the leader of the free world, was the general who led us to victory in World War II, and a man who enjoyed a good game of golf. The leader of communist Russia, our arch enemy, was Nikita Khrushchev, a short, balding, bombastic man who kept threatening to bury the free world. He made a perfect villain for the American people. Khrushchev's partner in crime was the dictator of Cuba, Fidel Castro, a man who Americans feared, and a person who many of us felt needed a shower and a shave. Now, despite the Cold War, this was a time when our cultural horizons were being lifted higher and higher, to the relief of many American parents. That hip-shaking rock and roller Elvis Presley had been drafted into the army and shipped overseas, away from their kids. This was also a time when science and technology looked to be the cure-all for our ills. Man was, for the first time, reaching out into space, although, judging by our first efforts, it didn't look as though we'd ever get there. To children growing up in this era, it was, above all else, 
the golden age of television. Of all the great TV programs of this era, who can ever forget the one show that poked and prodded at your youthful sensibilities and challenged your still developing mind? A show that lifted us out of the day-to-day -day realities of a changing world. Indeed, a show that gave us two characters who will live forever in the annals of television history and in our hearts and minds. Rocket J. Squirrel and Pullwinkle J. Moose. And our heroes blindly rode straight into frightful danger. Oh, what foul fiend could do a trick like that? What venal villain? What perfidious scoundrel? Allow me to introduce myself. Boris Badenov at your service. Yes, it was true. The mysterious stranger was Boris Badenov, the world's lowest snake in the grass. Please, no more compliments. You'll turn my pretty head. Hello? Rocky the Flying Squirrel speaking. What's oh, for you, Boo Winkle? Somebody else wants a weather forecast. Oh, bad days. Just when I was catching up on my reading. The Bobsy Twins at the seashore. Yeah, you can't beat the classics, I only see. Hello. Now, everybody raise their right hands and repeat after me. I solemnly swear to be honest, loyal, brave, clean, and trustworthy. Just a minute, buddy. Something wrong? Wrong? Oh, boy. What is this honest, brave, and loyal stuff? It's the new fan club, Oof. Maybe later on it mentions sly, nasty, and vile? Nope. Just honest, brave, clean, loyal, and trustworthy. And now, for all you senior students who are just about to graduate, here are some words of wisdom from Mr. Know-It-All. Buenos dias, seniors. Today's lecture is entitled, How to Catch a Bee and Make Your Honey Happy. It was a series unlike anything that had come before. It starred a moronic moose, an all-American squirrel, a pair of bumbling spies, and a truly oddball assortment of supporting characters. For many years, all the men who go down to the sea in ships, sailors, fishermen, garbage scout captains have heard and repeated the story of the legendary whaling whale, Maybe Dick. Maybe Dick was supposed to be big enough to swallow a whole ship. Maybe. He could swim faster than any vessel in the sea. Maybe. And he had been seen by sailors whose reputations for sobriety were beyond reproach. Maybe. Yes, for centuries, Maybe Dick has been a, a shadowy, shadowy terror for all seafaring sea men. men. Pretty exciting, eh, Rock? Oh, that's just an old wives' tale, Bullwinkle. Old wives with whiskers? I mean, it's just make-believe. Make-believe? Sure. There's no such thing as a wailing whale. Well, if you can't believe what you read in the comic books, what can you believe? Oh, Bullwinkle. It's enough to destroy a young moose's faith. Oh, come on. There just couldn't be such a thing. You did sure make a good premise for a story, though. Perry discovered the North Pole, Amundsen the South. However, neither of these esteemed explorers would have had much success finding Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, in the dead of winter. Incidentally, that's it. That uh, steeple sticking up out of the snow. Now, with the town submerged under 30 or 40 feet of the soft white stuff, you might wonder how its inhabitants managed to dig their way out. Well, they don't. They rely completely on a snowplow. A snowplow with antlers. Spring will be a trifle late this fall. There was something particular about the tone of the Bullwinkle cartoons, the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons, that really set them apart for kids then and for, you know, kids grown up looking back today because uh, they had a, an edge to them, they had a satiric thrust to them, and they had an irreverence to them that really was unlike anything else that we were seeing on TV. The creative Force behind this unique series was producer Jay Ward and veteran animator and writer Bill Scott. Jay Ward, who started out in the real estate business, had his first TV success with an animated series, Crusader Rabbit. Ward then joined with Bill Scott, and together they assembled a creative team that became famous for its ability to combine social satire, outright silliness, and world-class puns. Well, our heroes are really closing in on the Mooseberry Bush, for they've hired a famous mountain climber, Sir Hillary Pushemoff, and his friend, the Indian guide, Princess Bubbles, to guide them up the Grimalaya Mountains. Little do they know, however, that the guides are really those two spies, Boris and Natasha. 
Please, you're giving away the plot. Well, Sir Hillary, here's where we're going. High on the slopes of won't you take a peek? Won't you take a peek? What is new assignment, Boris? Kill moose? No, steel formula. What formula? Who cares? Any formula. Boris couldn't have picked a better day to look for a formula. For in another part of the city, one Dr. Bermuda Schwartz was testing his new invention for the army. Now, when I push this plunger, that bridge over there is going to blow up with a million pieces. Very well, Doctor. Let it go. Right. <laughs> Amazing, that bridge blew up without a sound. <laughs> I thought you'd notice that. Congratulations, Doctor. You have invented the first silent explosive. I call it hush boom And you've got to admit, it's a little bit different. There's no question about it. Ask any senior citizen residing in Frostbite Falls what the major event of the year is, and he'll reply... The Frostbite Falls Flotilla Festival. And why is that? Because all the noisy kids are down at Veronica Lake. Where'd you get that thing? What thing? What it is you're about to launch. And the starry-eyed moose related the story in flashback form of how one day, while ambling along the old rocks road, he stumbled onto an ancient rust-encrusted dhow. Dhow about that. A dhow, spelled D-H-O-W, is a sailing vessel primarily used in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. Whoa, look at it sparkle. And looky here on the binnacle rock. That's the bow. It says... Omar! Goodness? Kayam! Omar Kayam! Hokey smokes what he's supposed to mean! You know what you have here? We were hoping that you'd tell us! This little dow here is composed of ruby! Yes, sir, it's rubies! No, it isn't! It's mine! Well, my gosh, if it's made out of rubies, then... If you're hesitating for me to finish the line, you've got a long wait! And I don't have the guts to say it! Okay, then here goes! If it's made out of rubies, then this must be the ruby yacht of Omar Khayyam. Mm. And with that little gem, we ring down the curtain. What does fate have in the jewelry store? Be with us next time for Let's Drink to the Ruby or Stoned Again. Jay was unusual. He was, he was not your... He was very shy, oddly. But he thrived on other people's eccentricities, and he wanted, he wanted to have himself thought of as being eccentric, which is a little difficult when you're shy. I didn't know you knew how to type, Bullwinkle. Nothing to it. Clean booty fergles up, pretty eagle. Of course, that's just the first draft. Look, Chief, hot scoops. Mysterious bomber demolishes warehouse. Mad fiend burns old folks' home. Express train derailed. Great reporting, Boris. When did these happen? Any time now. <laughs> I'm working on it. Jay Ward was a genius. I mean, there's no getting away from that. You've got to remember that uh, that he did create the first animated show to ever appear on TV, Crusader Rabbit, which is still a, a classic of sorts. And, and uh, uh, the man had a way of looking at things that was slightly, you know, left of center, no matter what he looked at. It was always through a, an eye that, that uh, wanted to laugh at it. He never, uh, he never wanted to take anything straight. Hello, poetry pals. I'm wearing this Old Mother Hubbard because today's poem is Old Mother Hubbard. Pretty slick, huh? Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was there, and so the poor dog got none. Hold it, hold it. You mean after five years of watchdog and I don't get a bone? That's what the poem says. That does it. I'm going on strike. On strike? I'll pull out every pooch from Potskull of Paducah. Mother Hubbard unfair to canine. But, but... She's anti dog. No, oh, I'm Mother Hubbard. Jay was a very congenial amiable man but besides being that he was a very perspicacious man he knew precisely what he wanted he never interviewed actors he knew whom he wanted he knew what we could do to deliver precisely th the fashion that he created I Oh, I got it! I got it! Gee, not so hard, Bullwinkle. That's the third pass receiver we've lost today. We don't lose him, Rock. They pick him up in the next county. But passing wasn't Bullwinkle's only football talent. When he put his head down and charged, he could take out one whole side of the opposing line. That's what I like, a player who uses his head. It's also good for hanging hats on. Came time for Wasamata U's first game with the Watchmakers Technical Institute. Or as it is known, tick tock tick. Bill Scott was a man who was in many ways the complete opposite of Jay Ward. Whereas Ward often shunned public appearances, 
Bill Scott was a performer and did many of the characters' voices, including Bullwinkle. I wrote the first pilot for, for uh, the Bullwinkle show. I wrote it for Jay Ward. Uh, Jay Ward is a functional illiterate, and so I used to read things to him as, instead of having him read them. And he would laugh hilariously and fall on the floor, which was all very gratifying. And then we recorded the pilot. When we recorded the pilot, we were in a, in a, in a little recording studio. Here is June Foray, one of the finest voice actresses in the world. Here is Paul Fries, who is the voice of everybody. And there is me. And uh, we are assigning parts, and I said to Jay, well, who's going to do Bullwinkle? And he said, oh, I thought you were. So with that remarkable bit of casting, I, I became the voice of Bullwinkle, and then also the voice of Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties, and uh, Mr. Peabody of Peabody's Improbable History, and uh, a number of others in, in the entire J. Ward canon from that point on. Well, Bill Scott was in many ways the heart and soul of those shows, as much as Jay was. Uh, they were quite a formidable team. Scott was also a deeply religious and charitable man. He held very liberal political beliefs, while his partner, Jay Ward, was quite the conservative. But the one thing they had in common was a very irreverent sense of humor. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. That's capital P-I-double-G-S. Yes, yes, of course. These three little pigs, Portland, Penelope, and Alice, were sisters who lived together in a cunning little house, or they did for a while, anyway. Is this the pig residence? Capital P-I-double-G, pig. That's it, lady. Yes, it is. Got a singing telegram for you. <clears throat> Put on the skillet. Put on the lid. Your rich uncle just wound up dead. What? That ain't all. I tell you true. He left a million bucks to you. Oh, great. And all the little piggies got moolah, moolah. All the little piggies got moolah now. Collect. Bill was as outgoing and gregarious as Jay was shy. Uh, they made a wonderful team. Uh, old William, as Jay used to call him. Old William will do this, old William will do that. And they got along great, and they kidded each other all the time. And uh, they, they were just this marvelous, roly-poly team. You know, and they were both a little overweight, and more than a little overweight. And they were the Tweedledum and Tweedledee of, 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 uh, of the cartoon world. And I remember one day I was sort of sulking around and Bill stuck his head in and says, what's the matter? And I said, well, Bill, I said, I'm 25 years old and I'm writing for a damn moose. You know, Bill says, you think you've got it bad? He says, I'm 48 years old and I am one. Oh, I hate my uncle, but I love my antlers. Cause antlers are a moose's best friend. A rock! Huh? What is a bullwinkle? Hand me my shower cap, will you? Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Anything I can't stand is wet horns. Of the two main characters in the show, Rocky the Squirrel and Bullwinkle, Rocky was the straight man, or straight squirrel, if you will. Indeed, he was the first squirrel to become an all-American hero. Department. Of course. Open your mouth and say ah. Uh -uh. Not but, say ah. Uh. Ah. Hold it. Uh -uh. Mm, you need glasses. I have glasses. So you do. You see, my buddy and his bunion were swiped. Swiped, swiped. Have you tried the FBI? No, but I will. Is this the... You'll ask the questions, fella. Name? Rocky. Occupation? I'm a squirrel. Uh -huh. Problem? My buddy, his bunion, swiped. Tried missing persons? I was already there. Well, that's the nice thing about Washington. What's that? You always travel in the right circles. <coughs> so I said, well, what kind of a character is, is Rocky the Flying Squirrel? He said, just a plain little boy. But he said, I want him caricatured a little bit. So I said, well, uh, how about something like this? You know, uh, maybe he's a little um, petulant at times. But anyway, that's the way he should be. And Jay said, oh, that's marvelous. Sure is dark in here. Yeah, I can't see my hand in front of my face. You don't have your hand in front of your face. Well, I said I couldn't see it. Look ahead there, Bullwinkle. Sure enough, at the end of the passage, light shone through a crack in the door. Sounds like voices in there, Bullwinkle. Yeah. Put your ear to the door and listen. Unfortunately, the only way Bullwinkle could put his ear to the door was to put his antlers through the door, which is just what he did. 
Rainbow, wake up! I can't, I can't. My head bone is stuck. And in a moment, the door was flung wide, dragging Bowwinkle into the room. Hokey smoke, Bowwinkle, look! Well, what dreadful sight has driven the roses from Rocky's cheeks? We'll see you next time in Doorway to Danger or Doom in the Room. When the series was being created, no one could know at the time that the one character who would in his own way become an American icon, the one character who would capture the imagination of America's youth, was a moronic moose named Bullwinkle. He developed a cult following around the nation. Hi, poetry people! Today's poem is the saga of a singing waiter, Tommy Tucker. That's me. Little Tommy Tucker sings for his supper. What shall he have? Brown bread and butter. How shall he... Waiter? Sir? Uh, how's the Irish stew tonight? Oh, the taters are old and the meat is a fright. Everything is left over from Saturday night. We sweep it all up, put it into a pot, and tell you it's real Irish stew that we got. Uh, what about the chicken liver? Way down the bottom is for me, river. Far, far away, two, three, four. There, they embalm our chicken liver, and that's what you get today. Bullwinkle was just an unassuming moose, like any other moose. And yet he became a moose among men, a giant among lesser moose. And above all, he became, for reasons that defy explanation, a genuine American hero. Oh, if I could be anyone in the world, there'd be no brightest star to twinkle. Oh, if I could be anyone in the world, I'd be happy to be. Oh, so happy to be. Hokey Smoke, be sure to stay tuned as we cover the Cold War from Frostbite Falls, and then go off and... The fact that behind every successful television series, there is a seldom honored yet vitally important group of hard-working actors whose job it is to make the stars shine bigger and brighter. They are, of course, the supporting players. Every star has them. Lucy and Ricky had Fred and Ethel. Rob and Laura Petri had Buddy and Sally. Ralph and Alice had Trixie and Ed Norton. As far as our heroes Rocky and Bullwinkle were concerned, they attracted a veritable creme de la creme of supporting characters. In essence, the Mercury players of the cartoon world. Foremost among these players was that intellectual dog, Mr. Peabody, and his boy, Sherman. Via Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine, he and Sherman took us on some, shall we say, unique historical adventures. Hello there, Peabody here. And this is the Wayback Machine for traveling through time. And this is my boy, Sherman. Speak, Sherman. Hello. Good boy. And today we visit Napoleon. Peabody here. Sherman and I have a date with Florence. Florence who, Mr. Peabody? Florence, Italy, Sherman. Today the Wayback Machine will take us back to the year 1506 to a small studio in Florence where we'll visit that great genius of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. Peabody here. Today, Sherman and I are going back to the year 64 A.D. to visit with one of history's most renowned violinists. Jack Benny? No, that would be 39 A.D., Sherman. Our illustrious fiddler was none other than the Emperor of Rome, Nero. We set the way back controls, and before you could say quo vadis, we were standing on the steps of Nero's palace. Mr. Peabody, uh, I've always felt what came out of Clifton Webb because he was uh, smug and snide and condescending. And uh, the voice was a dead ringer. Well, for a kid who's, you know, suffering through history classes in school, to watch Mr. Peabody and Sherman go into the Wayback Machine and have experiences with these same historical characters, well, it wasn't supposed to be an educational cartoon in any way, but it was educational because it was making references to things that might ring a bell or that might clarify something, or even in a humorous and backhanded way, give you some insight into the person that you were supposed to be learning about. 
Peabody here, and for you poetry lovers, today's excursion into yesteryear will be a highly informative one. Are we going to visit Ogden Nash, Mr. Peabody? No, Sherman. The poetic personality we will tete tete with is none other than William Shakespeare. Now playing a new play by Will Shakespeare, Romeo and Zelda. Romeo and Zelda? Must be a misprint. But it wasn't, for inside the play was in rehearsal and... Zelda, wherefore art thou Zelda? Instead of appearing on the balcony, Juliet, or rather Zelda, came marching out of the wings, carrying a large flower pot. She left the stage and went directly to a familiar figure who was sitting all alone in the front row. That must be William Shakespeare, Mr. Peabody. And look, she's going to present him with a flower. She presented him with a flower, all right. Pot and all. That'll teach you to steal my play. It's a man wearing a disguise. Francis Bacon, if I'm not mistaken, and I never am. Bacon, you'll fry for this. Oh, hark, what hollow light burneth in yonder patio. He dead the lads in that libber. Verily, I shall ascend to yon balcony and meet my beloved. Easy with your big toe, Sherman. You're crushing my collarbone. Zelda, I mean Juliet. Thou art wherefore, Juliet? You can well imagine Sherman's dismay when, instead of a lovely young maiden, a lovely young lion appeared. In one prodigious leap, the cat left the balcony and proceeded to empty the theater. He then turned on us. Run for your lives, the performance is canceled. Quick, Mr. Peabody! No need to panic, we'll simply ring the curtain down. Oh, the tragedy of it all, that this should happen to me. If I ever found the rogue who owned that beast... That beast is mine! Bacon with eggs! Every Peabody episode ended with a terrible pun. Uh, that Peabody would say something outrageous so that uh, the, the boy, Sherman, would say, would respond with, oh my, you know, that's terrible, that's awful. The only thing I don't understand is why Mr. McSnide wanted to change the rules of golf. Well, you see, McSnide objected to the use of a golf ball. What did he expect to play with? Potatoes. He owned a potato farm and hoped to make a fortune selling them to golfers. But who ever heard of hitting a potato with a golf club? Oh, come now, Sherman. Surely you've heard of... <laughs> mashy potatoes? Pass the gravy. And because of his poor eyesight, a cause of eye trouble was named after him. A cause for eye trouble was named after William Tell? What's that, Mr. Peabody? Why, television, of course. Isaac Newton's brother, Figby? What's he famous for? Oh, he invented a cookie. Oh, Mr. Peabody, you don't mean... I certainly do. Figby Newton was the inventor of the Fig Newton. <laughs> Another supporting character who played a major role in the success of Rocky and Bullwinkle was that fearless, wholesome, brave, handsome, sensitive, do-gooding, idiotic, totally moronic, guardian of the North, Dudley Do-Right. Don't worry. As you know, the Canadian Mounties always get their men. You see, here comes a mountain now. Nell! Nell! I did as you said. I got my man. Dudley, how many times have I got to tell you? This is a dog. This is a man. Oh, all right. You're under arrest. No, 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 no. Not this man. Oh, well, never mind. This is about the squarest Marty I've ever seen. Hmm. That's right, sir. Square shooting Dudley do right at your service. Dudley, how do you feel about Lawrence Welk? Only terrific, Inspector. That's real toe-tapping music. I've always loved the Dudley because Jay said I, I was modeled after him. Well, he was modeled after me. But if you look at Dudley, he looked like a great Mountie should look. He was the perfect-looking Mountie, but he was a complete moron. I mean, the guy, you know, was, was the village idiot. Th that's the interesting thing about Dudley Do-Right, is that, is that uh, the Bullwinkle show is shown throughout the world. They made all kinds of foreign deals. The one place that they weren't able to sell it is in Canada because uh, whomever deals with the Canadian uh, broadcasting, people who buy for them, felt that the, the, the uh, caricature of a Mountie uh, would be uh, harmful to the, to the image of the Mounties and therefore they never were allowed to show it. Most of the Dudley Do rights were I took great pride in because uh, I was an old, I'm still am an old silent movie fan, and that's what I tried to do with Dudley Do Right was do the iris in, the iris out with the satirical titles, and then even the name Snidey Whiplash, things of that nature. Uh, I thought those were quite unique and very special and very funny. In his fight against crime in the Great White North, 
Dudley Do-Right faced the despicable Snidely Whiplash, who was as evil as Dudley was good. The voice of Snidely was veteran character actor Hans Conried. And if there is anyone present who objects to this union, let him speak now. The gentleman about to object is Dudley's lifelong enemy, the malevolent Snidely Whiplash. I don't know what it means, but I object. Whiplash, you cur, so you would ruin my wedding, eh? As a scarf, yes. Dudley picked up the thing nearest to him, which happened to be Nell, and threw it. Aha! I have her, and you shall never get her back. Or any other part of her. And the voice of Dudley's girlfriend, Nell, whom Snidely wanted for his own, but who, unbeknownst to anyone, was in love with Dudley's horse, whose name was, uh... <clears throat> horse was played by June Foray. Little Nell, uh, he said, well, just do anything you want for little Nell. And I had um, done this voice when I was very young. Uh, I was about 12 years old, and I, I thought I was being very sophisticated using a voice like that, and I thought, that would be wonderful for little Nell. Oh, save me! Save me! Somebody save me! Don't go all to pieces, Nell. Wait about five seconds. It looked like Nell Fenwick's wick was about to be extinguished when... The jig is up, Whiplash! Dudley, the saw! He pulled the lever all right, but the one that said free wheeling. The saw rotated madly, broke free of its moorings, and ate its way around the mill. I created a Frankenstein. Within five minutes, the saw mill had been reduced to saw dust. As for Whiplash, he was last seen heading in the general direction of downtown Toronto, closely followed by the saw. Oh, Dudley, my hero. Nell, my heroine. Not only did each Bullwinkle and Rocky show bring us the adventures of Peabody and Sherman, as well as Dudley, Nell, and Snidely, we were also treated to a rather twisted look at the venerable fairy tales we all grew up with in the segment entitled Fractured Fairy Tales. Once upon a time, there was a young girl named Goldilocks who, for no other reason besides wanting to get rich, decided to go into business for herself. Taking all the money that she had earned as a chimney sweep, she purchased a large lodge high up in the mountains and set about the task of turning it into a winter resort. She worked very hard getting things ready for the happy, money-bearing crowds that were soon to come, and then, at last, she was done. It was opening day and she flung open the doors. Welcome to Goldie's Winter Vacationers! But alas, not one single Winter Vacationer showed up, for unfortunately, Goldilocks had overlooked one little detail. She had opened her winter resort in the summer. Oh, drat! Once upon a time in a city far away lived a kindly old woodcarver named Geppetto. His workshop was in the poorer section of town. It was very tiny, and his only tool was a crude jackknife. Boy, this whittling sure gets to be a drag. Look at me talking to a pine topper dummy. Oh, if you was only a real kid. I could have get your paper out somewhere. Take it easy for a while. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red who had an exclusive shop in the Hollywoods where she sold riding hoods. That's why they call me Red Riding Hood. Cute. One day, a very wealthy customer entered her shop. Oh, boy. Uh, yes, madam, may I help you? I should like to buy a wolfskin riding hood. Wolfskin? Yes. Meanwhile, not too far away, a mother wolf was calling to her son. Walter! Yes, Mama, honey? I want you to take this basket to Grandma's house right away. But she was here only yesterday and took a whole basket of stuff. I know, but she forgot her teeth. There was a section of the show called The Fractured Fairy Tales. And uh, so I got the one to do called Sleeping Beauty Land. That story concerned uh, a prince who had a castle, and he had secured... Uh, this uh, sleeping beauty and had her ensconced up in the castle and he threw it open to the public and sold tickets and uh, it was a takeoff on Disneyland you see and I caricatured the prince as Walt Disney you all remember the story of sleeping beauty how as a baby she was put under a spell by a wicked fairy how when she had grown up she pricked her finger with a needle and fell into a deep sleep from which she could be wakened only by a kiss you remember too how a fence of thorns grew round the castle to prevent anybody from entering anybody but me that is and just who are you a prince naturally don't you see the robes the crown you want to see my id card well how do you propose to enter the castle easy i haul out my trusty broadsword and 
They don't make broadswords like they used to. Sleeping Beauty, I've come at last. With one kiss, I shall wake a new end. Wait a minute. Awake, she's just another princess. Asleep, she's a gold mine. I can see it now. Sleeping Beauty comics, Sleeping Beauty hats, Sleeping Beauty bubble gum, and biggest of all, Sleeping Beauty Land. Sure enough, the castle was soon made ready as a great tourist attraction. There was Moat Land. Have your ex coupons ready, please. Have your ex coupons ready. There was Entrance Hall Land. Y coupons, please. There was Stair Land. That's a Z coupon, folks. A Z coupon. And of course, Sleeping Beauty herself. Sleeping Beauty Land was clearly a great success. When the writers on the series ran out of actual fairy tales to work with, it posed no problem whatsoever. They did what any astute television writer would do in that situation. They made up their own. Oh, how are you, dear? Enchanted. Gargling doesn't help. Oh, huh? gargling, aspirins, mustard plasters, nothing. Um, uh, maybe if I stepped on your cat's tail. Are you out of your mind? I didn't think it was a good idea. But as King Dumb turned to go. <coughs> Is this where I get changed into a frog? Worse than that, fella. Let me look. You will marry the queen and have a son with a nose like a cassava melon. And until he says to the world, I got a nose like a cassava melon... He'll have a nose like a cassava melon. You got that? Oh, it seems a little hard. But if anybody tells him the magic words ahead of time, they shall perish, like, instantly. Understand? Is it over? Am I a frog? I don't think so, dear. No, he wasn't. And what's more, the queen was no longer under her enchantment. And so the king married the queen, and they lived happily ever after until their first son was born, at which time the king turned into a frog and was never heard from again. You know, I sort of expected this all along. It can be said without question that no one was safe when it came to satire and humor in the Bullwinkle and Rocky show. Everyone was a target. Politicians, movie stars, athletes, historical figures, literary giants, television personalities. It just didn't matter. Hello out there in TV land. Welcome to the big Bullwinkle and Rocky fan club dinner at Telethon. Yes, sir, you're going to see such names as Bob Hope, Marlon Brando, Jane Mansfield, and Perry Como. But that's all you're going to see their names. For guests, we've got Rocky J. Squirrel. Boris Benenov is going to be really big shoe. And our telephone girl, Natasha Fatal. The number to call with your donations is Sucker 92222. Or if that's busy, call Shakedown 56565. That's the Chinese restaurant downstairs. They'll take a message. We uh, offended nations, countries, politicians, school teachers, weather people, <laughs> no matter what, you know. And here, with his bird's eye view and a brain to match, is Mr. Know-it-all. Our subject for today is how to be a beatnik. Some people think the beatnik is merely a bum with sunglasses, but he is more than that. Though not much. The first step in becoming a beatnik is to grow a beard. This can be a long process, particularly if you're a girl. Clothing-wise, we should remember this important rule. The well-dressed beatnik is seldom meatnik. But everybody was under the uh, was under Jay's uh, satirical eye. Ian Scott uh, had that because they were such uh, opposite points of view in terms of the political thinking. Then, then, then he would attack the right, the left. It didn't matter. They were just. Anybody who was pompous, without humor, uh, businesslike, was always uh, could be scalped by those guys. One of the most famous running jokes in the Bullwinkle Show concerned a television personality named Derwood Kirby. Kirby first became famous as the co-host of the Gary Moore Show, and then moved on to co-host the hit series Candid Camera. Using the name Derwood Kirby. The creative team came up with a storyline that revolved around the search for the fabled Kerwood Derby. Here is the ultimate weapon. That's a weapon? That's the weapon. But that's just a derby hat. Not just a derby hat, bad enough. This is the Kerwood Derby. The Kerwood Derby? Quiet, you fool. The Kerwood Derby? Jawohl. And Phyllis Leader told Boris the legend of the fabulous bowler. The Kerwood Derby had first been owned by a cave dweller many eons ago who put it on and said... 
Pardon me, my dear. I've got something to do. Like what? I'm going to invent the wheel. And he did. Later on, it was owned by a man named Aristotle, who one day in his bath cried, Eureka! I have found it! You found Aristotle's law of displacement and specific gravity? No, you idiot. I found it so. The Kerwood Derby was won by Philip of Macedonia when he conquered the world, and by Genghis Khan when he conquered the world, and by Julius Caesar when he conquered the world, and by Elvis Presley when he... Oh, never mind. It disappeared for a time, but its last known owner was a Princeton College professor who put it on and said... Of course. E equals MC squared. Why didn't I think of that before? Yes, the Kerwood Derby turns anyone who wears it into the smartest man in the world. And they got this lawyer's letter from Derwood Kirby, who was a a big uh, TV star at the time, and, and Jay sent him back a letter saying, yeah, please sue us. You know, uh, we need the publicity. Anything will help. Of course, we never heard from them again. Once my head is under that hat, bad enough, you'll be smart. What? I mean smarter, dear old chiefy boy, honey pot, superior officer Dow. Mm. Bad enough, you're making my cuffs soggy. Sorry. And what happens when your fearless leader is all-powerful? But the way now rules the world. Stay tuned for a visit with the fabled first family of Pennsylvania. But now, darling, and the... While the leaders of the superpowers played games, the world sank deeper and deeper into the Cold War. The world may have taken the Cold War quite seriously, but the creators of Rocky and Bullwinkle didn't. Their answer to the Cold War was the creation of the arch spies from Pennsylvania, Boris Badenov and Natasha Fatal. Boris and Natasha were thinly disguised characters of Russian spies. For reasons never made quite clear, these two bungling spies spent all their time trying to thwart our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle. They never quite succeeded. Yodly dodly hodly ho! Allow me to introduce myself, Sir Hillary Pushemov at your service. Come down, princess. Who's that? That is famous Indian guide, Princess Bobbling Spring that runs in the meadow. <laughs> Call me Bubbles. I got low standards, you know. Come, Natasha, we start our own outfit. The Boris Bedenov Fan Club. Well, what do you think of the new clubhouse? Is real eyesore, Boris. You really think so? You're not just saying that to make me feel good. Oh, I wouldn't kid you, darling. With little work, it could be blight our whole community. Think big, Natasha. We'll have Boris Bedenov fan clubs blemishing whole country. New chapters festering up everywhere. How do we do this, Boris? How else? Advertise on television. Feeling grouchy, irritable, nasty, then Boris's fan club needs you. Modern day clean living got you down. Want to strike a blow for foul play? Then join Boris Bedenov Beast Corps. This was a paid fanatical announcement. Double your pleasure, double your fun. Join Boris's fan club and learn hit and run. You know, there were those implications that, uh, that the, a lot of the stuff about Boris and Natasha were inspired then there was some kind of sinister uh, CIA infiltration into our ranks to uh, to make the uh, the Russians look look bad I mean there, there's nothing could have been more ridiculous than to, to suggest that oh bury me not on the lone berry Boris they're crazy about Moose's singing well who can play at that game Natasha, hand me my belly like it. And my big cheese disguise. Here, darling. Ahem. Me, me, me. And then began one of the strangest battles of all time. A musical contest to capture the affection of a hundred thousand moon mice. You ain't nothing but the moon mouse. Oh, 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 munching all the time. Yep, eh, eh. Come along. You ain't the skinny chicken dinner. The one who picks a wishbone. Oh, lie, yes, you don't step on my blue straight tail. Oh, oh, oh. There must be little cupies in the briny. There must be little cupies in the sea. You're my little high school moon mouse. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, we can look. Your audience is leaving you. Looks like your singing career is over already. Man, that was the shortest career I ever had. Yes, the moon mice were leaving the boys' cottage and heading right for Boris. Looks like you've won, darling. What I told you, Natasha. You can't keep a good red down. 
Boris Badenov and Natasha Patel represented everything that was evil and anti-American. They were, as Boris himself would have proudly put it, a couple of no good nicks. Boris's voice was done by actor Paul Fries, and Natasha was voiced by the multi-talented June Foray. So he said, I said, well, how would you like Natasha? He said, don't make her Russian. He said, she's not a Russian spy. She and Boris are from Pennsylvania. Because, uh, as you know, Russia thought that we started the Cold War with them. It, uh, they were very incensed about that. So we tried to make it a Pottsylvania accent. Boo-hoo-hoo! Hold it, Bullwinkle! That sounds like a lady in distress! So? Gee, didn't you ever read the Hero's Handbook? I can never get past the picture of General MacArthur on the cover. Well, Chapter 2 says we should always help ladies in distress. Hi there, lady! Are you in distress? This dress, that dress, who cares? I'm distraught. Do we help ladies in distraught? What's the trouble? It's about next Saturday's game. With Hard Knocks College? Don't worry, we'll mobilize them. That's just it. My little brother is on that team. Your brother? Crazy Legs Cowfuss. And if Hard Knocks doesn't win Saturday, they'll throw him off the team. Gee. They'll take away his sweater. And it's turning cool, too. They won't even let him watch American bandstand. Is there no pity anywhere? So, your great, big, wonderful moose... That's me, all right. Maybe you could see to it that Hard Knocks wins next Saturday. Why not? Bullwinkle, you can't do that. I'm supposed to help ladies in distress. But Chapter 3 says you never throw a game. Well... You read your chapter, I'll read mine. What was that you called me, Missy? A great, big, wonderful schnook. Well, well Jay, Jay and Bill encountered many, many uh, problems with, with the uh, NBC. Uh, they were called standards and practices. And in fact, Bill, Bill used to say to me that th- they have a policy for not doing something. They never have a policy for doing anything. It's always not doing anything. I know one, one of the times um, they had Sam the Native who was Bill Conrad. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, anyway, they, he had Bullwinkle and Rocky in a pot. He was going to make a stew out of them. And one of the network people called Jay and said, you can't have cannibalism on the show. And Jay said, a moose and a squirrel? And meanwhile, what of Rocky himself? Well, he's tied to a stake in the middle of a mesa, awaiting heaven knows what. Yeah, what are we waiting for? We wait for Big Chief. It's pretty cold out here, you know. No worries. We build fire for you. And our hero's captor set fire to a pile of branches on which he was standing. Hey, you can't do that. Who say? The network say. Quote, no cannibalism on TV. Unquote. We don't eat you, just roast you. Oh. Oh, well, I guess that's okay, then. And the network-approved flames lick higher and higher. Don't miss our next episode of The Fire Chaser or Bullwinkle Goes to Blazes. Of Jay Ward's many talents, perhaps he was best at creative publicity for Bullwinkle and Rocky. In 1963, he and East Coast press agent Alan Poshko put on the first and last Coney Island Film Festival attracting over 4,000 fans. But maybe his most famous stunt was the building and then unveiling of a 15-foot statue of Bullwinkle and Rocky that stands proudly on busy Sunset Boulevard. He was promotional-minded in those days because he was going to take Sunset Boulevard and block it off and put up this huge grandstand and put bands up there and just celebrate. Bill and Jay wore top hat and evening clothes, but tennis shoes. Jay had a, an album composed of Mussolini's fight songs, gave away straw hats with bullwinkle antlers coming out of them, um, and uh, got Jane Mansfield to do the ribbon pulling. Jay Ward had this incredible mailing list, and he would do all sorts of things. He had a statehood for Mussolini kit. He actually bought an island off the coast of Minnesota and named it Mussylvania. And then he decided that he was going to have a campaign to have it adopted for statehood. 
Armed with a petition signed by thousands of people, Jay Ward and publicist Howard Brandy set off on a nationwide tour to campaign for Musylvania's statehood. And, and so we got this van, with this Ford van, with this calliope that played circus music, and we took off cross-country, and we visited 50, 60 states. I mean, it was just a very city, city, I should say that. It culminated when we got to Washington, D.C., and, and Jay had this huge list of, uh, of names, uh, signatures uh, for state of Pennsylvania, and we got into the van, and we were accompanied by Pat Humphrey, who was Hubert Humphrey's daughter-in-law, who was the NBC rep, and Jay was driving the van, she was next to him, and I was sitting in the back, or hiding in the back is more like it, and, and uh, we got to the White House gate, and uh, the man said, what are you doing? And he said, turn off that music, and Jay said, uh, said well, you know, we're here to see President Kennedy, we want state of Pennsylvania. And uh, the guy said, turn around and get out of here. And Jay said, you know, you could be civil. I mean, I said, Jay, turn around. He said, no, I don't like his attitude. And, uh, of course, the guy then started to unbuckle his revolver. And I panicked. I mean, I just, I said, Jay, let's get out of here. And Jay didn't like his attitude. He said, well, I will, but, I mean, the man is absolutely rude. And we turned around and left. And... Uh, that afternoon, I took the photographs that were taken of us in the car by the White House, and I went to the AP office, and I said to the man, look, we tried to get into the White House, and they wouldn't let us, and I thought, Kevin, he had a sense of humor and all that kind of stuff, and he said, come, let me show you something, and he took me over and showed me the photographs of the uh, Russian ships with the missiles uh, covered going toward Cuba, and we had arrived at the White House on the day of the Cuban Missile Crisis, so nobody paid any attention to us, even though we were very funny, and... Uh, that end of the tour, and then we drove back home. Uh, never did get stated from Pennsylvania either. Of all the classic cartoons that have appeared on television in its history, few have had the impact that Bullwinkle and Rocky have had on a generation of America's youth. It is safe to say that the series had a lasting and somewhat profound impact on those children who grew up watching it. We never in the world thought that it would be the cult program that it was. Uh, Bill Scott used to have a marvelous uh, saying that because he was he was one of the brilliant writers when uh, when we would go to festivals and and make public appearances and so forth and young people uh, would say we love the show and I grew up with you he'd say well you know we've corrupted a new generation and I think we are still doing that. And propelled by mighty moose muscle, Rocky Flash cleared to town into the grocery store and back before you can say Jack Robinson. Jack Robinson! Here I am! By golly, I couldn't do that. There, there was never a feeling that you were doing anything important. Uh, first of all, Jay would have punctured that balloon very quickly, you know? Fine here, fella. It's a college scholarship. A oh, scholarship? Certainly. I can see at a glance you're brainy. Yeah. You're intelligent. Yeah. You're brilliant. Yeah. Then why don't you sign... I forget how to make a bee. We knew that we were entertaining ourselves, which is always the best thing you can do. If you can make yourself laugh, it's, it's a great audience. And we never wrote down to children or at a certain age group, and it was just trying to do the best you could. And the, as I say, the, the parameters that they had were just to be wild and imaginative as can be. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? I must, must leave. Presto! No doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. If you first watched those shows when you were a kid, one of the incredible experiences in growing up and going back to them is this light bulb that goes on as you realize what the gags are all about. Bullwinkle, you can't enter the race. I'd like to know why not. The rules clearly stipulate no human over ten can participate. I'm about as inhuman as you can get. You're a moose. And that's another reason. There, there, there's so much joy that, that was in my life because of Jay that, that there's, a, there's an emptiness now that, I, that I, uh, it's hard for me to, uh, to express. But, but, you know, Jay Ward... I'm getting the chills. Jay Ward really uh, was the kindest, most gentle, funny human being I've ever been associated in my life. How do you thank somebody for a million laughs? 
And here on the soggy shores of Musselvania, we find our heroes, Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Boo Winkle Moose. Boy, what a terrible place. Only too true, Musselvania is the wettest, soggiest, dreariest place on Earth. You forgot useless. Useless, too. Situated directly between the United States and Canada, Musselvania has the distinction of being constantly fought over by both countries. The U.S. insists it's part of Canada, and Canada insists it's part of the U.S. Well, why do we come here on our vacation? Because after two weeks in Musselvania, any place else in the world seems like heaven. Send me to Siberia, send me to Wilkes-Barre, but not Musselvania. No, no, that is don't lose your head. I'm not losing my head. You will if you don't go to Musselvania. What time leaves the next submarine? Well, our heroes have certainly had some terrible shocks in more ways than one. For just as they were about to be rescued by a Coast Guard ship, the vessel tossed a couple of death charges at them. Rocky and Bowwinkle had disappeared. At the Coast Guard, jubilation reigned. Good show, Carruthers. They're gone. Thank you, sir. Send this message to Washington. Sighted sub sank same. But, sir, somebody already said that. Nonsense. If they liked it once, they'll love it twice. Yes, sir. But just then, there was a splintering crash as something flew in through the window. Something with antlers. On top of something with an aviator's helmet. It's a moose and a squirrel, Admiral. They must have been blown here by the depth charge. Then their enemy agents seized them. And our heroes were quickly subdued. I was pretty subdued when we started. All right, you. What was the name of your submarine? Submarine? Hokey Smoke! Got that, Carruthers? We sank the Hokey Smoke. Last time, you remember, the trustees of Wasamata U were wondering how to keep their college from going bankrupt. How about giving an honorary degree to Danny Warbucks? You, Nanny, he's only a make-believe character. We're real? In the end, of course, they followed the lead of so many other colleges, they decided to get a winning football team. As a result, two scouts are trying to sign a Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle, you know who these fellas are? Pick and Pat? No. Gallagher and Sheen? No. Null and Boyd? Fair and Wormy? No, they're scouts. If they're scouts, let's see them rub two sticks together. They're football scouts. Then let's see them rub two footballs together. Let's check the little old rule book, Edgar. Uh-oh. Trouble? Says here we can enroll anybody except a moose. Let me say that. Oh, Chauncey, that doesn't say moose. No. That's mouse. Hot diggity! Well, the old place is back to subnormal, Rock. Yeah, and we... Hey, was that a shot? Heck no, Rock. Well, it sounded like a shot. Nope. Then what was it? That was... The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. But watch for another episode soon of Rocky and Bullwinkle. It may be a little hard to find, but don't give up. We're not. Travel arrangements for the cast and crew of this show made by Seat of Your Pants Flying School. Accommodations for the cast and crew were provided by the Moose Lodge, situated high atop. Why don't you take a peek? This show was filmed in part in the land of Musylvania on the Isle of Lucy near the shores of Veronica Lake. The scientific consultant on this program was Dr. Bermuda Schwartz. Grateful acknowledgement is given to the Musselvania Film and Television Commission and to the people of Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. <laughs>